make everyone aware everyone aware that we will be recording the presentation. Let me make sure I don't have to accept it. Okay. Um, and there will be time for questions and discussions afterwards that will not be recorded. Uh, please feel free to type up any questions in the chat or I believe you can do it either in the chat or QA, q and A. I will man both of those and um, during the presentation and then we'll get to them during our time for discussion. Um, so I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Adam Finkel, who's agreed to be our guest speaker today. For those of you who do not know him, Dr. Finkel is a clinical professor of environmental health sciences at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He is also an independent consultant specializing in plaintiff's exposure to toxicants in the workplace and general environment. Dr. Finkel holds a PsyD in environmental health sciences from the Harvard School of Public Health a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, an AB in biology from Harvard College, and he's also a certified industrial hygienist. He began working on CT issues sometime in 2016 as a consultant, and prior to that, he was executive director of the Penn Program on Regulation, where he was also a senior fellow at the Penn Law School from 2008 to 2017. From 04 to 08, he was a visiting professor of public and international affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University and a professor of environmental and occupational health at UMDNJ School of Public Health. From 2000 to 2003, Dr. Finkel was a regional administrator for OSHA, the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, responsible for regulatory enforcement, compliance assistance, and outreach activities in the six state Rocky Mountain region. Today, he'll be discussing prospects for governmental intervention to reduce occupational brain disease associated with repeated head impacts and two other topics. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Thank you, Dr. Finkel, for joining us today. Great. Thanks, Andrea. And uh, yeah, I'm part time at, at Michigan, uh, but I'm uh, currently in Princeton, where I've lived for a long time, where I used to teach. Um, just so you know, where I am and the sun is almost not coming through the window anymore. So you won't see that bright light on my head. Um, okay, now I am trying to, okay. So I'm just gonna give a very brief introduction to uh, what you all already certainly know as well or better than I do about the sort of current state of um, public uh, interest in, in brain disease and football and then talk mostly about uh, uh, my time at OSHA in addition to the enforcement job I had in the 2000s for the five years prior in the Clinton administration, I was uh, the chief rulemaking and regulatory official uh, in OSHA headquarters. So that, that, that is why uh, the Harvard Football Players Health Study contacted me in 2015 to uh, help them with the legal and uh, uh, governmental aspects of what they were doing and I'll talk about that. So you know here's one of many um, I used to have a little video clip I don't have it anymore but uh, looking at the words here that uh, the, the Steelers quote utterly destroyed a, a quarterback uh, on live TV and you know, we could go back many many years and see all kinds of examples of uh, the highlight highlight films every night would, would show the big hits as uh, something of special interest to the public. Here are a couple of quotes, a uh, quote from a uh, former president uh, talking about somebody who, uh, a, a fan who fell victim to a temporary heat stroke and talked about uh, how, how soft the game has gotten uh, with these concussions. Um, a quote from Roger Goodell that I'll come back to later um, about how, well, yeah, we have risk in our game, but there's risk in everything. Uh, and I think there's a New Yorker cartoon uh, under my uh, Zoom window. Uh, of course, many examples from the popular media uh, about this issue. Uh, everybody knows about the Will Smith film. Uh, but here's a book that I read some years ago. Um, I've not checked back to see what, what's up with Ben Utecht. Uh, maybe you folks know him and his story better than I do. But I thought this quote of his from the book is quite poignant about his essence as a human being uh, and the response that the uh, owner of the Buccaneers gave to him at the time. So as I said, uh, the, the Harvard folks uh, got, of course, a large grant from the League and the Players Association uh, and did several years of, of studies of the, of the science, law, ethics, uh, controls, all sorts of aspects of this issue. And uh, Glenn Cohen, who was running the uh, sort of legal part of it from, from his uh, position at the law school, 
uh, asked me to help uh, the team uh, think through what the possible governmental responses to uh, brain disease in pro sports uh, might be. So this is one of Chris Tuvert's slides. Chris is now back uh, as an attorney uh, in the, in the uh, I believe he works for one of the teams or used to work for the league. Uh, but these are his questions and the same ones that, that we got together uh, to ask. So it culminated in an article in the Arizona Law Review in 2018. And uh, I may just reduce my thing that's getting in the way here and just, uh, just, just quote, whoops, um, one sentence or two from the abstract of this article. Sorry, I keep trying to get this window. I'll just minimize it. Uh, that uh, it was a, you know, the first real long uh, article in a law review to explore what might happen if society treated professional football like the workplace that it is. So here's some uh, further quotes from the article. Um, the orientation that I brought to this uh, work was that as I'll talk about, uh, the, the government for 50 plus years through my former agency uh, is in the business of reducing risk, not uh, uh, putting people out of work or eliminating industries or, or eliminating risk, but of balancing uh, the costs and the burdens of regulation against the benefits thereof. And so I thought it was interesting that the somewhat infamous Dr. Pellman, uh, who worked for the league in the 1990s, uh, said, and I think he was quite right, uh, to say that, that concussions and possible sequelae of concussions are part of the profession, just like the steel worker uh, who works at great altitude. And my response to that was to say, okay, so treating uh, football players like the workers they are means that we have to think about that balance. Uh, one could say that deadly falls are part of the profession and that would be true, but that hardly means that every uh, such risk should be uh, approved of. And so in, in any occupation, there are, tremendous disparities or variabilities in uh, within uh, tasks that people undertake and within the spectrum of companies uh, and establishments and how uh, seriously or, or frivolously they take their uh, health and safety responsibilities. So here's an example that uh, there are many construction projects with a uh, huge death toll and there are other projects where uh, people have worked for tens of millions of hours without a single Fatality. So it, it depends on the combination of governmental involvement uh, and employee employer involvement uh, in taking joint responsibility for safety. So really the, the key question here is how does uh, my former agency and public health uh, agencies and professionals more generally, how do we think about what risk levels are acceptable and what evidence base do we use to try to uh, establish what the status quo risk is and if it's uh, large enough to be a target for reduction. So we use um, all kinds of evidence, uh, preferring um, all the way up to the, the gold standard, which, which never happens in our field, but which would be a, some kind of a randomized controlled trial. We don't have those for ethical reasons, but we do have natural experiments where we can really see with our own eyes that not only are things uh, contributing to an increased incidence of disease in, in, in our case in the workplace, but that when the exposures are reduced, we can actually see in uh, national or targeted data over time, uh, a, a concomitant res, uh, reduction in, in disease burden and death toll. But that's rare. Usually we have a combination of human epidemiology, uh, animal toxicology, and case reports. And one point that we make in this long article uh, at some length is that uh, when we start to think about the benefits of some progression towards more and more uh, information dissemination or ultimately regulation, sometimes case reports alone uh, have been sufficient to motivate uh, government and also sufficient for courts to say that this is a, a fitting and proper thing uh, for government to do, even though we haven't even gotten to uh, cohort studies or case control studies with real statistics. We just have case results. So I think I will um, now give a, a slide here. So in my, in my second life, uh, I'm a, a choral singer and a choral conductor. And uh, so on the left-hand side is uh, uh, President Kennedy and Francis Kelsey, uh, who was a, a scientist at the FDA in the 1950s. And she really single-handedly uh, kept the drug thalidomide out of the U.S. marketplace uh, at that time. And it was right around 
uh, the, the time uh, I was uh, in utero and my mother had various conditions and, and would, would certainly have taken uh, thalidomide for, um, for the pregnancy if it had been available. Uh, the guy on the right is someone I've had the honor to sing with in the past. He's a German baritone named Thomas Klosthoff, uh, who was a victim of thalidomide. He has rudimentary arms and legs, has an unbelievable voice of, of great volume, but um, you know the rest of him is um, suffers from uh, from this constellation of birth defects. And so Frances Kelsey did what she did, uh, put the the brakes on bringing this drug into the U.S. Uh, based on three, count them, three case reports uh, of this rare uh, constellation of uh, birth defects called Focomelia in Australia. Uh, and I, uh, I guess I will come back to this at the very end, but this comes, uh, this quote comes from a, a new paper uh, I contributed to, uh, may not be a direct quote, it may be from some um, writing I did with the co-authors, but, but it seems to me that uh, one of my bottom line here is that the profusion of people writing about CTE uh, without uh, public health epidemiology risk assessment experience, it's a little bit like going back in time and imagining that when, this, when these case reports uh, first came to light in the late 50s, that the literature was busy arguing about you know, what to call this uh, set of birth defects, uh, presenting um, uh, different estimates of, of how much of this might be idiopathic and, and in the natural background, and, and coming up with other reasons to not uh, intervene or not uh, warn people about this. So I'll come back to that. So back to OSHA in specific. Um, so this is from the seminal uh, Supreme Court case, which is now 40 plus years ago, when uh, the, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 was interpreted by the Supreme Court with respect to risk and benefit and uh, OSHA's authority to regulate. And the bottom line is the court said that, that we at, at OSHA are not allowed to uh, continue to pursue risk reduction all the way down to zero. We have to at some point, well, we have to start with a showing that the risk is, quote, significant, and we have to uh, sort of stop uh, imposing controls when we get to a point where we think uh, further controls will, will no longer uh, reduce a risk that is significant. Uh, the court said that, uh, used the term not a mathematical straitjacket, gave the agency tremendous discretion to set its own policy views about what level of probability of harm, uh, grave harm would be significant. And they really, uh, they gave us some goalposts, but really uh, sort of punted on the key question of uh, what does this word significant mean? All they said was at one chance in one billion, uh, you'd have to be a little um, strange to consider that significant, but at the uh, chance of one case in a thousand or one chance in a thousand, this would be of, of you know, death or grave disease over a lifetime. Uh, one could not reasonably not consider that significant. So OSHA was given discretion within that million fold range to come up with its own definition of significant. And as one might imagine in a somewhat beleaguered risk averse agency, uh, somewhat dominated uh, by Department of Labor lawyers that the decision was made sort of tacitly to stay at the top end of that window uh, where the court said we had, we had no, no problem uh, declaring something significant. So OSHA has always sort of settled for one in 1000 uh, as a uh, stopping point for risk reduction. In contrast to EPA, which has been told explicitly by Congress in most of its statutes to try to go down to one in a million. A uh, little bit about, just for background, uh, OSHA's involvement in entertainment and sports. This is uh, salient right now because of the uh, Alec Baldwin incident uh, of a fatality with a, a loaded gun. I don't know that OSHA has any plans to be involved in that. I've heard nothing uh, of the sort. But these are just some of the cases in the, in the uh, 2001 to 2016 period uh, of OSHA asserting that entertainment and sports are no different than any other occupation. If there are egregious uh, violations or, or uh, lapses in an establishment that it's uh, proper for OSHA to come in and say, you have violated any one of our standards or violated uh, what's called the general duty clause to uh, pro provide a health and safe, healthy and safe workplace, even in the absence of a specific uh, numerical limit. 
So this became uh, a, a flashpoint for uh, the second highest court in the land, the DC Circuit Court in uh, 2014. Uh, I just think it's a really interesting uh, human interest story here. Uh, this has to do with SeaWorld, the, uh, the animal uh, 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 water show where a, uh, a particular killer whale had uh, both in, in uh, Europe and South America and the whale was moved into Florida, uh, had killed three different uh, workers who were, who were uh, performing with the whale. And the case made it up to the DC circuit. Uh, Gene Scalia, the son of uh, Justice Scalia was uh, uh, represented SeaWorld. Uh, and it was a two to one decision with Merrick Garland in the two person majority and Brett Kavanaugh in the one person minority. So all kinds of uh, interesting names uh, uh, coming together in this uh, decision. And it has great bearing on, on today's topic because the court two to one said that there's nothing about entertainment or sport that makes it any different in terms of uh, where OSHA is able to assert jurisdiction than, than any other kind of manufacturing or service industry. Uh, the court, the, 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 two, the two majority uh, ju justice judges said that um, logging, welding, foundry, these are all industries where uh, employers could claim that the workers were willing participants, that they had known physical risk, uh, taking part in the normal activities, but that doesn't make uh, sport any different. Um, Kavan, on the other hand, said uh, that uh, he thought there was a case, which I think he didn't get right uh, at all, uh, having to do with ethane oxide, the Peleron case, but he said that there's a difference between uh, all other workplaces where uh, there's a distinction between the, the process and the product and entertainment and sports, where he says the, the product is the production. I found it interesting that uh, now he's on the Supreme Court talking about uh, how he's a strict uh, textualist and he only looks at uh, the plain meaning of the, the constitution of the statute. And here's, uh, I think, a fairly incriminating quote where he says, uh, in his view, it's not plausible that Congress basically silently intended to authorize uh, OSHA to regulate sport. What he said was uh, he, he just can't believe that they didn't mean to exclude sport, even though there's no, the word sport or entertainment does not appear uh, in the act. So he's basically making up language that is not in the statute uh, in the name of originalism. The other case, by the way, where this came up, uh, really the only Supreme Court case, well, had to do with uh, golf. And if anybody remembers uh, Casey Martin, who had some chronic uh, uh, disease of the extremities, made him very uh, fragile to walk, but was a very good golfer and um, basically petitioned the court and, and won the case to be allowed to use a golf cart uh, and just drive to each of his shots and, and play golf that way. Um, the court said that walking is not uh, intrinsic to the game and that uh, the, the uh, in this case, the uh, American with Disabilities Act could be interpreted to uh, have some bearing on how uh, the, uh, the PGA could run its tournaments. So before I talk about uh, the spectrum of what OSHA could do, and of course the bottom line is there has been no intervention uh, whatsoever by my, my agency. So this is all uh, speculative at this point. But uh, I, do, I do wanna just give a little bit of background about the, the, the quantitative risk of CTE in uh, professional football. There's, there's more recent studies of, of, of college and, and rugby and soccer and other things, but I was concentrating with the, the Harvard group on football. Uh, so just a couple of uh, data points here, pa papers I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, obviously, the, 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 the key uh, C case series is the Boston University series, where I think this is still the right number, that 110 of the 111 uh, brains that were donated uh, by former NFL players were found uh, in a blinded way to have the uh, characteristic lesions of CTE uh, in, in the brains. So really, the key controversy then and now remains, uh, we all know that that fraction, 110 over 111 or 99%, you know, is not the right number. It's a highly uh, biased sample uh, that suffers from selection bias of people with next of kin, of, of people who had reason to donate their brains were the ones who uh, overwhelmingly preferentially did donate their brains. Um, no surprise that where I'm going to come out is that 
when one has a biased set of uh, case reports, the proper attitude towards it is neither to accept it at face value nor to throw it out and say we know nothing because we can't use this information that's somehow polluted by by bias. The proper way to think about it is can we can we correct for the bias? Uh, so that previous slide was the was the probability of uh, uh, being diagnosed with CTE given uh, that symptoms were occurring in this uh, non-representative group of 99%, and then also some of the BU work uh, bears on the question of what's the probability of finding uh, symptoms uh, retrospectively in in life by by recollection of the next of kin of people who were later diagnosed at autopsy with CTE. And that's also a very large number, 33 out of 36, with, uh, with the group claiming that the other three, uh, at least two of them may have been um, what they call a cognitive reserve, that these may have been especially intelligent uh, people who uh, did not uh, uh, show decrement on uh, neuropsychological testing, but that may have been because they were up in the right-hand tail to begin with. Uh, another big data point is from my uh, co-author of one of my papers, Kevin Beinick, who's now at uh, uh, was at Mayo and now is at, in in Texas at a at a brain bank. Uh, but he looked at uh, a large number of uh, brains from a, from a uh, brain bank of uh, people with neurodegenerative disorders uh, and found a uh, essentially an infinite odds ratio. No one in the group that had no documented history of contact sport exposure had CTE, whereas about a third of the people uh, with the uh, history uh, were found uh, with these lesions. Uh, and then a bit of information on dose response. This is getting a bit old, but uh, one of the uh, BU group uh, papers uh, uh, purports to find uh, basically a, a linear with threshold uh, dose response function uh, with cumulative uh, sort of proxy for cumulative g-force uh, over a career as the uh, as the measure of, uh, of exposure. And of course, there's a lot of information. I won't go through it about uh, animal models and plausible mechanism. So one of the things I did with the Harvard group and ultimately branched off from them and, and published a couple of papers separately was to ask the question, what do we do with this uh, clearly non-representative uh, case series of 110 over 111 brains? Uh, but what do we do uh, to try and estimate risk based on what we know is uh, imperfect information? And so I tried it two ways. Uh, the, the main uh, approach was to say, let's be conservative and say that the 110 cases is the ultimate total number that we, that we, we have seen a lot in, in a particular time period, but we will never see another case. And what, so therefore, what is the minimum risk in that cohort if every single person in that group who, who played, basically who showed up in the league between 1963 and 2008, if every one of the players who will ever get CT have already uh, been diagnosed by BU, uh, what's, what is that uh, rate? What is that frequency? And it, it takes some calculation to come up with a good estimate of the denominator. The, you have to subtract out from all the people who've ever played during that time, the people who basically were bench bench players who didn't play very much. Uh, but depending on how you do it and depending on what number you use for the uh, average length of a career, which gives you some uh, estimate of the churn, the number of new players that come into the league every few years, uh, you get an, I got two answers of the, of the absolute minimum that that risk could be uh, between six, six per thousand and 13 per thousand. So that's way, way, way lower than the 99% uh, face value uh, that you would get from assuming that the, that the BU series is not biased, which it clearly is, uh, but it's also in both cases well above the one per thousand uh, uh, policy judgment of a risk that is quote unquote significant enough for the, uh, the OSHA agency to, to uh, intervene in some way. The other way one can look at this is to, uh, rather than to think about the denominator as being all players, you could think about the denominator as being all deaths in that cohort. Uh, that may be an unbiased estimate. Uh, it probably is biased upwards because people with CTE will probably die at a younger age and therefore 
uh, join that numerator earlier in time than others. But still, if you just ask of the uh, 110 cases, how many people in that cohort uh, that played from 63 to 2008 uh, had died as of the time that I wrote this, uh, it was about 16%. And that number may go down over time as more people die of other causes. But again, a, a best estimate um, at this snapshot in time would be that when everyone in that group, all those 15,000 odd uh, people have finally died of something, uh, that about 15% of them will have died uh, of or with CTE. And again, I think that's probably a, a high estimate. But so we've got sort of two numbers in the, in the you know, around 10 per thousand or 1% range. And then we have a, as a, as a minimum, and then we have a, a number around 15% as a possible uh, mid, mid estimate or, or an upper bound estimate. And the only other group that's looked at this in the same sort of way is, uh, is uh, Zach Binney and Kathleen Baczynski, uh, who who've calculated it might be around 10%. So we're, we're all sort of in the same ballpark. And their caveats, uh, if there is a background, uh, a, a sporadic incidence of this uh, lesion uh, in uh, unexposed people, and I've not been convinced that, that there even is one, uh, uh, the Gao et al. paper from 2017 talked about one person who uh, they believe had no documented or possible history of head trauma. Uh, but anyway, uh, if there is a background, then like with anything else, one would subtract it out. Uh, and then for OSHA purposes, one would uh, need to subtract out the portion of the risk that was attributed to exposures before the working lifetime begins, namely uh, college, although college uh, sports are now coming um, in the spotlight as being possibly uh, covered uh, as as work by uh, by regulation, but certainly high school and and uh, and uh, club sports would not be count would not be counted. So getting to the title of the talk, uh, what could the government do about this? Um, rep being mindful that it's not just sports; that there are other occupations where uh, repeated head trauma is is clearly uh, an issue. Uh, in this Arizona article, we came up with, uh, I think, eight or maybe there are 10 when I get to the next slide, uh, things that OSHA could do. And I'm putting these in, the, in ascending order of intrusiveness and stringency, which is really the same to say the descending order of plausibility, because uh, the, the more intervention uh, that is contemplated, I think the less likely, um, for reasons I'll get into, that it will, it will ever happen. So at one end of the spectrum would be, uh, again, none of this has happened yet. Uh, my former agency is just busy with, with other, well, they were busy doing nothing for four years and now they're busy with COVID, but uh, there has been no brochures or guidance or, or public service announcements about uh, head trauma. Um, there could be uh, sort of a photo opportunity, sort of alliances that might, that might happen. Uh, I'm going to focus on number four in a minute. That's where I come down as the most uh, sensible sort of middle ground uh, option. But I do want to point out that if if the stars aligned and the agency was going to be actually uh, uh, forthright and 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 sort of assert jurisdiction and control, there are still gradations of what they could do, uh, re ranging up to a, a comprehensive OSHA standard that's been done for many, many other uh, health and safety hazards in the past. Uh, and such a standard might include requirements to assess the exposure that uh, workers in, in sport uh, undergo through sensors on their equipment or on their bodies. Uh, maybe conceivably some limits on the cumulative G-force that one be, might be able to uh, encounter before there are some controls that must be put on. Uh, again, possible rule changes, possible medical surveillance requirements that have been part of other standards that we've done, uh, protocols for uh, being sidelined and, and when you can return to work. Um, even a possibility in, in most occupations and all other occupations, OSHA doesn't like the idea of spreading the risk around more people. Uh, we don't let people get exposed to radiation up to a certain limit and then tell them to go somewhere else in the, in the workplace and let other people get exposed to more radiation. But if you believe that there's a threshold and that uh, some number of subconcussive injuries is associated with zero risk, then it might actually make some sense to uh, uh, spread that exposure among more people uh, through some kind of guidance to the league to, uh, 
uh, to do that. But I, I think where I come out here, uh, I'll use this other slide, is a mechanism that uh, I have a, a bias here. It's a mechanism I pioneered in the late 90s, early 2000s. But it was the idea of working in uh, collaboration with an affected industry. And rather than just write a rule and have them come to a hearing and argue about it and, and complain and then go to court and sue and either win or lose or get some relief from the courts, uh, to work with them from the get-go and to say, look, you, you guys may know more about your processes than we do. Uh, you may have the, the need and the ability to tailor your guidance or your, your uh, protocols over time as you learn more, uh, as circumstances change. So maybe what we should do is to allow you to write your own regulation, your own code of practice, and then sort of mail it to us and we'll look at it. And if we think it's a good code of practice, we can, through a legal mechanism called the General Duty Authority, we, we at OSHA can uh, inspect your workplace. And instead of testing you against our regulation, we will test you against your, the promises that you made to yourselves, to your employees and to the government. And if you're in breach of your own contract, you are in violation. But if you're following your own rules, you're not. So we did this with a number of industry groups, including uh, the people who make all of the fiberglass insulation in the US. There are about uh, a dozen of those companies. And we had a very successful program that sort of fizzled out um, in the late uh, uh, Bush years around 2008. But for about 10 years, it, it went, went very well and uh, resulted in a lot of risk reduction in that industry, uh, a lot of uh, training that was done for free by the manufacturers to their customers, the, the people who install uh, fiberglass insulation in, in, in homes, uh, a lot of data collection of exposures, a lot of uh, respirators were given out for free, all of which were promises that the industry made to itself, to its workers, to its customers, and to us, and that we thought were eminently reasonable and that we were very happy to help uh, enforce, but really to help uh, steward. Um, so this could be done with the NFL. This could be a partnership where the government and the league could get together and uh, spur on the, the creation of, of rule changes and medical monitoring and return to work protocols and, and better technology and all those things and have it be a, a living document uh, that the league itself would adhere to, but with the government would be a, sort of an overseer of that. And I think that's on balance the most reasonable, um, although ambitious given uh, these factors, which I think are next. Yes. Yeah, so why is OSHA reluctant to involve itself in, in pro football? It really, it really is a third rail that it doesn't want to, to deal with. Um, lack of expertise, but they've overcome that in the past. Uh, resource constraints, it's a $500 million agency as compared to a $20 billion uh, agency that does environmental health and, and safety. Um, afraid of being punished by Congress. I won't have time to go into some of the past uh, instances where the agency has been accused of transgression and it had, bu had budgets reduced, had uh, strictures put on it and called the Gestapo and all that stuff. Uh, and also a, uh, uh, a law that was passed about 20 years ago uh, that's back in the news, the congressional veto of agency regulation that happened. We, OSHA was the first agency to have a, a rule vetoed in 2001 on repetitive motion and ergonomics. And there is a theory, which I think is not correct, but there's a theory that that law uh, prevents the agency from ever regulating in the same, the same area ever again if it's made the mistake and gotten mad, gotten Congress mad enough to veto something. So that's obviously a real concern. If you, if you issue a rule that's just ever so slightly uh, annoying to Congress and they veto it, you may be uh, prohibited from ever trying it again. And that's a, that's a real worry. I don't think it's a legally legitimate worry, but the myth is out there and it's, and it's uh, uh, deterrent. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, I've been in and around this agency for a very long time and worked at EPA uh, also uh, over the years. And I think both these agencies have some degree of what the psychologists call uh, learned helplessness, that you, you train this horse that they, it, it can't get away. You tie it to a, a, a heavy immovable object uh, and eventually you don't have to waste money on the immovable object, you just tie it to a plastic chair and it's, it's been ingrained to think that it, it's not free, it has no chance of, 
uh, of, of asserting its independence. And so you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's just docile. Uh, let me check my time here. So I do want to take time for questions. I'll just try and wrap up with, with these two other topics. So one of them is probably the more uh, incendiary, uh, but I've been writing to some extent about fallacies and illogic and uh, hand-waving that I've seen in this literature, uh, mostly among uh, uh, medical doctors who just don't have the, the, the training or the orientation to think about uh, evidence the way a public health or, or a risk assessment person would. So uh, here's a very recent example of the British uh, House of Commons uh, had a report a couple of months ago. And um, so one of the things that the, the parliamentarian said was uh, an active lifestyle uh, promotes good health. And, and my uh, quip in, in response to that is that that's like saying hydration is important. So it really doesn't matter whether you drink water or bleach. Uh, it comes back to the Roger Goodell quote, yes, there's risk of being sedentary, but surely there are many things one could do to get one's heart rate up uh, you know, over a lifetime without uh, playing pro football. Uh, similarly, with respect to the British equivalent of OSHA, their response to the parliamentarians was, uh, we would not expect to be involved in sport. Um, we believe that the governing bodies were best placed. So they basically you know, completely abdicated, which is more or less what, what my agency has done, although not as forthrightly, they've just uh, put their head in the sand and said nothing. So here's on the left, a uh, article from six years ago by one of the prominent uh, reporters from the New York Times on, on this issue, uh, who continues to write about it. And I think is, is um, growing and, and learning. But six years ago, Ken Belson was saying that we're not sure about this because there are people who have, um, uh, well, there are, there are people who've played a full career and lived a long, healthy life and died of something else or living long, healthy lives and not dying of so and not uh, suffering. Uh, you, you can play without CTE. And there are people who uh, seem to have had uh, uh, symptoms while alive, but were autopsy did not found to have the lesions. And here's a letter from The Lancet, a uh, similar um, quote from uh, Willie Stewart uh, that I and others responded to uh, a few months later. But uh, he talks about the, uh, uh, what I think is a straw man, that there are people telling players that, uh, that your uh, neurodegeneration is inevitable. And uh, he's worried about uh, depression and suicide uh, coming from that, uh, what he calls doing harm uh, medically by, by telling people that. Uh, I've not found any evidence that anyone has ever said that. The, the closest I could find is Anne McKee saying about seven years ago that there, she said there's something like there, there may in the future, we may learn that there will have been a shockingly high incidence of CTE in the NFL. Um, I don't know if she's ever repeated that, but that's close to inevitable, but that's one uh, stray comment in, uh, in a decade. So here are some, uh, what I'm calling fallacies by anecdote. I probably should go through these quickly, but uh, again, the, the four fallacies that I see most often are uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you can have the exposure without the disease. And of course, that's the very definition of risk. Risk is something that happens with probability between zero and one. And if you think about smoking and lung cancer, as I go through this slide, uh, every one of these examples uh, can have a, an analogy uh, to that well-known uh, strong association or, or causal relationship, depending on what you believe. Uh, you can obviously smoke for a lifetime and die of something else, but that has zero relevance to the association or causality between uh, tobacco and lung cancer. Uh, secondly, you can uh, have the disease without the exposure. I'm not sure, as I said, that that has been found in any human being to date, but let's say it is found in one, 10, 100, 1,000 uh, such people. Again, if you go back to smoking and, and lung cancer, uh, of course there is lung cancer that occurs from things other than smoking, um, radon being a, a very large example. The, the fact of multiple causes says nothing at all about the relationship between one exposure and, and the disease. And then on the scale of uh, what these lesions are, uh, there are people who 
I think are still saying maybe they are not clinically significant. Um, on the far right is a quote from um, someone I won't name, but but someone who reviewed uh, our internally uh, our law review article and said we're not sure that this is harm yet. Uh, I believe it may be someday, but right now I don't. I'm not willing to call these lesions uh, harmful. And uh, the mirror image there would be that, uh, yes, it's possible that there are people uh, with the symptoms and without the exposure. And again, uh, there are many, many exposures that cause multiple conditions uh, and various presentations of, of almost any uh, chronic disease. So this is a, from a paper, but it's really the same slide. And just wrapping up, there are other fallacies out there. Uh, there are a lot of papers, uh, I'm reviewing one now actually, that, that compares uh, rates in uh, former NFL or former, former college players of things like suicide, depression, uh, or CTE itself to the general population. And that's a fundamental mistake. It's possible to do it and recognize the bias, but if you are fit enough to work at all, and certainly fit enough to be a professional football player, you are more healthy than the average person and more healthy than the frail people who are part of that general population. So uh, suicide could be a double-edged sword, but I don't think we know uh, what the propensity of people who uh, are strong and healthy and uh, many of whom are quite uh, well-to-do financially because of their abilities. Uh, what is their propensity to commit suicide uh, later in life? Maybe it's greater because of their fall from fame and fall fall from fortune, but uh, to compare that rate to the entire country uh, is sort of a non-starter, I think. So I won't have time to go th through this. I wanna finish up, but uh, the slides will be available. Uh, this is a good quote from a great uh, epidemiologist who studied lung cancer all of his career. Uh, and he said uh, about that uh, relationship between smoking and lung cancer, this is, 50 years ago now, but he said a thousand years from now, when we know everything and we don't know nearly everything about smoking and lung cancer, we will still not know why uh, my brother got cancer from smoking and, and I did. We, it will be in its infancy uh, for, for all of the future. Uh, and to say that because this, this particular disease and relationship is scientifically in its infancy is a true statement, but in my view, not in any way a a rationale for waiting until it is no longer in its infancy, which will be centuries from now. So the final slide before I stop, uh, we have a new paper out, Stephen Casper at Clarkson is the first author uh, with 16 others and myself. And we talk about the uh, international consensus statements on concussion and basically uh, just have a wide ranging uh, set of concerns. We think that these processes are not inclusive enough. Uh, they don't consider the perspectives of public health people, uh, risk professionals, epidemiologists, and particularly uh, uh, employees, patients, next of kin, and other people who have important things to add. We're concerned about the lack of disclosure, conflicts of interest, lack of peer review, uh, lack of transparency on how things are discussed and voted on. Uh, and here on the right, this is, uh, I think, more or less my writing, some specific concerns about how these groups come together and end up with statements that, that I think are, are not nearly uh, forthright enough about what we do, do know at this point about this particular uh, exposure disease relationship. So I hope I haven't gone too long and I will stop here and try and, well, I should probably keep my slides minimized. So thanks very much.